Naive T cell activation and proliferation. And I'm going to go ahead and branch this off into two uh, larger categories, mostly being interleukin 2 and then the supramolecular activation complex. And um, I may have to do more than one video on the, or at least more than one slide on the supramolecular activation complex because it's really long and complicated. But anyways, what it consists of is two major phenomenon happening. There's the MHC peptide complex interacting with the T-cell receptor and then the co-receptors itself. That's going to cause some signaling cascades and then the co-stimulatory signal also causes signaling cascades and they kind of converge to have this one massive effect. T-cell receptor and co-T-cell receptors and the co-stimulatory signal. I guess if I were to think about this in terms of the job that this thing is um, and I don't, you know, my book doesn't talk about it. I'm using a different textbook than um, Charles, the Charles Janeway immunobiology textbook does. But this is something that I learned from their uh, little like videos, things and, and things that they're talking about that. This is all about the scaffold production. And the scaffold production is kind of the first step of this long signaling cascade. So who are the players involved in the scaffold production? Well, that consists of your T cell co-receptor, the CD3 complex, and then a new compound no or new molecule protein known as CD45. So attached to the co-receptor is this. Sorry, I'm really tired. I said that the LCK is a tyrosine kinase, and it's actually a soluble tyrosine kinase that has other roles than just with what we're talking about here. But in this context, um, CD45 has the ability, at least, to act as a phosphatase. I guess I should be more specific and say that it has a phosphatase domain. Phosphatase domain of this is going to actually remove a phosphate group and it results in a conformational change or you can think of it as just activation of, I'm just going to say active LCK and once LCK becomes an active tyrosine kinase, well that's going to do two things. Well, I mean it has two targets that it does. Obviously all tyrosine kinase phosphorylate at kinase res at tyrosine residues. The sites that it's going to uh, phosphorylate are going to be things known as the ITAMs are located all throughout the CD3 complex. And right PO4 underneath there to show that it's it's actually acting to res reactant there. If you're wondering what ITAM stands for, that stands for immune immunoreceptor tyrosine-based activation motif. And that's what we see on CD3s. I guess I could write that out. But the other thing that it's going to, to act on is something known as ZAP70. So it's going to phosphate ITAM, uh, the specific ITAMs of the CD3 and then ZAP70. So 3 is definitely involved in this in that it has ITAMs, specifically the Zeta chain. So what happens here is, is once this ITAM becomes phosphorylated, okay, it's going to bind to zap 70. Now what does zap 70 do? So it's like it holds it in place if you can think about it. Now zap 70 is going to then get phosphorylated and once zap 70 becomes phosphorylated and activated this guy also is a tyrosine kinase and he's going to phosphorylate uh, three main parts really just two. Um, LAT and SLP76. Kind of running out of room, so I'm just going to say P underneath that. Um, and it, acting as a mediator protein for that is going to be a protein known as GAD. So these three things here collectively come up to make up the scaffold. You did all that work, right, in producing the scaffold structure here? But we're not done yet, right? This is all the stuff that is involved by itself in the activation of the uh, T cell receptor and the T cell co receptor with the MHC peptide complex of the dendritic cells. Um, CD45 is going to phosphatase, is a phosphatase domain that's going to activate LCK, which is attached to the co-receptor. LCK is going to phosphorylate ITAM regions, holding them in place, holding ZAP70 in place for LCK to phosphorylate him. Once ZAP70 gets phosphorylated by LCK, he's going to become an active tyrosine kinase, which phosphorylates a bunch of other proteins that are involved in the production of the scaffold. Okay, so still with me there? Next step that happens is in the part where the co-stimulatory signal happens. Remember, if the co-stimulatory signal does not initiate the T cell does not develop forward. It stays in a state of energy forever. And that's an irreversible state of energy. Just to remind ourselves of what the co-stimulatory signal is, this is the B7 on the dendritic cell interacting with CD28 on the naive, no, naive T cell. This process here results in the binding of something known as PI3K. And what that stands for is phosphatidyl inositol 3 kinase. But if you're like me, you're okay with PI3K. So what does PI3K do, in case you're curious? Well, PI3K is going to take PIP2 and then ultimately just phosphorylate it and convert it into PIP3. Obviously, if we're talking about kinases, 
We're involved in the movement of phosphates. We're definitely involved in the use of ATP. We do this in gold. PIP3 has some other effects as well. PIP3 is going to activate two other compounds that are really important. One of them is known as ITK, and then the next one is phospholipase C gamma. And then ITK in exchange is going to work and it's going to cause a conformational chain, which is going to change, which results in the activation of phospholipase C. PIP3 by itself is going to cause a conformational change, which is going to result in an activation of, I'm just going to say A for that, of phospholipase C. And then the scaffold over here, uh, once it gets phosphorylated, it's going to undergo things that are going to cause a conformational change, which is going to result in the activation of phospholipase C, right? So we're putting a lot of stuff involved in this. Both the, the initial MHC uh, peptide complex T-cell co-T-cell receptor and then the co-stimulatory signal are both converging together to produce a signal that's going to activate phospholipase C. And if you don't remember that from my biochemistry videos, phospholipase C, in this context, it's phospholipase C gamma, but it does pretty much the same thing, is going to take uh, PIP2 and then convert it into the two uh, common second messengers of diacylglycerol and IP3. So yeah. PIP2 reacts with phospholipase C gamma, which gives us diacylglycerol and IP. And hopefully I have room to talk about this. I know this is getting kind of uh, ugly to some extent, but diacylglycerol is going to do some things, and so is IP. Two things that I think are really important in highlighting is it's going to activate a long, a Ross cascade, which you should know what that is, hopefully already, uh, or if you're not, I have videos explaining what the Ross cascade is. Um, and it's also going to activate protein kinase C theta, I think. I'm not Greek or in a frat, so tell me what that means. Which activates something that we're already uh, pretty familiar with, NF kappa B. And then Ross system over here is going to activate AP1. Switching colors to IP3. You should, I, I expect you to know that IP3 always is going to go and cause the release of cytoplasmic calcium and then controlled release. And this is going to uh, end up activating on a compound known as calcineruin. Hopefully I'm not saying, I might be saying that wrong, but I'll spell it out for you. Calcineruin. And even though I have it written down right in front of me, I'm really bad at spelling, so you may want to double check me on that. So this is just a calcium activated phosphatase, which ultimately results in the production of something known as N-fat. Now N-fat is known as nuclear factor of activated T cells. So one of the things that hopefully you've observed, at least you know what NF-kappa B is, I don't know if you knew what AP1 and NFAT are, but all three of these guys are transcription factors. They are transcription factors that are going to result in a long series of cascade signaling, which results in other things that we've already talked about, like the uh, CD40, CD40 ligand and all that stuff happening here. Along with that, though, something else that happens with the co-stimulatory signal, as we've already kind of talked about, hopefully, is CTLA4 production starts to come in. CTLA4, as hopefully you know, already has a 20 times stronger B7 affinity. I did not smell that right. But it's binds stronger than CD28 does. Um, and what this does is this actually inhibits this signaling cascade here. Inhibits cell division signaling and proliferation and, and uh, maturation, sorry. Okay, so that's a lot, right? So something else that happens, though, with NFAT. NFAT is also a transcription factor, not just for division and, and proliferation, but it's a transcription factor for interleukin-2. We're going to start to produce interleukin-2, which is why I put this up here. So interleukin-2 is actually an autocrine. And just for giggles, I want you to remember this because its, it's nickname is literally the T-cell growth factor. So I think you can imagine what it's what it's involved in, the T-cell GF, or T-cell growth factor. So by the time we're starting to produce interleukin-2, we are activated T-cells. But I just wanted to really briefly, I know I don't have the whole lot of room here to talk about, but the interleukin-2 receptor uh, in both the activated and in the immature naive T-cell. So in the naive T-cell, um, the interleukin-2 receptor consists of a gamma subunit, a beta subunit, and it has a really, really, really low interleukin-2 affinity. However, once all this signaling cascade happens and NFAT comes into play, it's going to result in interleukin-2 being produced. And once the signaling happens here, and it's kind of like this, well, which came first, the chicken or the egg things? Yeah, 
But once this happens here, this is also going to signal a series of cascades that's going to result in the production of, at least in high concentrations, the active form. And once it becomes an active form, it's going to start to produce uh, beta and gamma already, but also beta, gamma, and alpha, and have a higher affinity. Gamma, beta, alpha, and it has a really, really high affinity for interleukin-2. So what regulates this activity as well? Um, well, this is also regulated in part by CTLA-4. And then as it moves along and it moves to areas where there's less of a concentration, the interaction of the interleukin-2 will diffuse away. But um, that's it for the naive T-cell activation and proliferation.